began because of peer pressure. Uh, we moved to the Chicago area when I was at that form formidable age of nine, and for, for a number of years there, I was surrounded by all the cool kids who all loved the Cubs, except for a few annoying younger brothers who were Sox fans. But I became a Cubs fan in those days because my peers were. I didn't care about baseball until they cared about baseball. I also would, he would form us through the people in our lives. Now, the fall, which I don't know why we call it a fall. It sounds like I've fallen and I can't get up. The fall, which is more like a rebellion, is a place that messed that plan up. But Jesus on the cross redeemed the plan that we still are to be influenced and molded and formed by God through the people in our lives. I taught English for 11 years. I like a good thesis statement. Before we dive into the scripture specifically, I'd like to give us a little bit of background. I find it so helpful to understand who wrote to whom and what the context of history was. It often brings things to light that otherwise I completely miss. So there's a few things about Hebrews that are delightful for me because they were an eloquent writer, some of the best best language in the New Testament in, in original form, and probably an eloquent speaker, the form of Hebrews is a really good sermon. So they make these guesses, but they really don't know who it is. I have a few thoughts. It's not the point today, so I'll move on. The audience, however, is far more certain. The law is what is, be, creates a pathway of right relationship with God. But when Jesus came onto earth, he said, no, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the one by which your right relationship, your righteousness is restored. And so for the, the Christians at this point in history, the turning back to Judaism. So this letter is written to people who are feeling enough persecution that they're thinking about giving up on the thing the, the thing that had given them hope. The book itself, as a total book, is a doctrinal book. It tells us who is Jesus Christ as the mediator. It sets up Jesus as the mediator between humanity and God, and the call to those who are reading goes on and gives a, a lot of examples. What does it look like? A person who has this confidence and assurance, what does their life look like? And it starts out with headliners. You know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joseph, the, the big names, the names we've known the stories of. And then it goes into the people that you might not know their names. And it describes this. This is what people who have this confidence and assurance, this is what their lives look like. This is what they do. They conquer Oh. See, at this moment, if I'm one of those Hebrew Christians, I realize this still could be me. Even in the state that I'm, even in the place that I'm in, the less successful looking place of being persecuted, this could be me. So after this long chapter, 11, of this Faith Hall of Fame, we get to the heart of where I want to land with us this morning, and that is the first two and a half, well, I was going to say Wisconsin football fans, but yesterday's game, maybe early, early on, the cheering fans around, and that there was this cloud of witnesses, and they were cheering me on, saying, Ruth, you can do it, you're good enough, you're smart enough, you're clever, you're whatever it is. And I always found that a little frustrating because I know myself and I know I'm not. But I always thought, oh, the great cloud of witnesses, because you've got people cheering you on, you should run this race. And that influenced you. Some of them may be authors. You've read their book. You've never met them face to face. They could be people from scripture. We have a cloud of witnesses around us that have influenced us. So I began to think, how has the cloud influenced me in this throwing off and this running and this eye fixing on Jesus? And I think of Ethel and Iris, two women I never met, but golly, I would have liked to have spent time with Ethel and Iris. Two women had a small cabin, call it, that they would live in, just a wooden structure. And this is where they would live and work and serve. And they'd been there for a, a good period of time. The, the caretakers provided their meals for them every day. So it was quite a deal, you know, room and board included. Um, the caretakers brought the meal and three meals a day, it was brown beans and and tortillas. So it was food. And uh, a few months in, they were there today. This is going to be great. 
oh God, and she prayed, and went about her day like you do when you begin to expect something from God, watching the horizon all day long, looking like, I don't want, I can't wait to see what this person that God's going to send with this egg. And the day went on and on and on, and it began to get later in the afternoon, and no one had shown up to sell an egg yet. And Ethel was starting to get a little discouraged, and yet she had faith, she had prayed, she trusted God was going to provide. She had a brown chicken around out through the bushes. And it's looking straight past them to the doorway into their house. And it comes. Like chickens do. Do you know about chickens? We're in Wisconsin. You've seen chickens besides the one in the grocery, right? So the chickens come and they kind of look at you one side and the other because their eyes aren't exactly, you know. And it's coming at them. And it gets up kind of close to Ethel. And Ethel's irritated looking at this. So they get a bucket, put some water in it, put it over the fire on the stove, and Iris has her soft boiled egg. What I love about their story is that it teaches me that it's more than just the sin that entangles us that we need to throw off. And the people in our lives help us to see those things. And these are women of incredible faith. I have great respect for them and the, the work that they've done. Throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. This is part of the good work that the great cloud of witnesses around us does. So therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us then run the race. Another person is a guy named Ed Kornfeld. I knew Ed, as you can, the best description, where this dirt come from, and send it to me. And so people have done that throughout a lot of times. So well, there was this guy named William, and he was in Borneo, and he put some dirt in a box, and he mailed it to Ed, and Ed took it with him to the office, which for Ed was not an office. It was a laboratory at Eli Lilly in Indianapolis, where Ed was an organic chemist, and he did what organic chemists do with dirt, apparently. And out of that dirt developed vancomycin, it's written in the plural. It's written to a community, not to a, a group of individuals. And I am convinced that you and I, as this church body, Christ Presbyterian Church, there is a calling that we collectively are given. There is a way or a race that is marked out for us as well. One that Doug so eloquently already described to us, reminded us that's something that God, he created for us to do. So this fits with that same, same picture. Last story about fixing our eyes on Jesus. My friend Cam, uh, it's not his real name, uh, it was a classmate of mine at Fuller for a number of classes together, and uh, Cam was, and he was doing training there for church planters. So Iranian Christian leaders teaching them how to begin a small congregation of people, bring them together, and grow the church in Iran. And it wasn't very many months before he and his wife were both imprisoned. And then the weeks went on and on and on, weeks of torment and torture and interrogation. My eyes on Jesus, he knew he needed to do that in this place of, of darkness. There came a point where um, some of the torture became awful. Specifically, they allowed him to believe that his wife had died uh, in prison. Let him overhear a conversation, one of those kinds of things. And so he, he believed that that was true. And now, um, now he's bringing to interrogation again. And, and let me read for you. These are his own words. He, he wrote this part of love of God to this man. And I responded according to that love. Can I pray for your back? I asked. He responded quickly with a positive, sure, most Muslims I know never turn down an offer of prayer. Perhaps he thought I would go to my cell and pray for him, or maybe I was just using religious talk that was common. But when I said, no, would you come forward so that I can put my hand on your back and pray for you if there was a miracle in that room that day, it is that Cam loved his persecutor with his eyes fixed on Jesus, the source of his faith, the one who brings his faith to perfection, Cam could genuinely, authentically love the man who was persecuting him, torturing him, torment. That would increase my faith 
grow my confidence and assurance, and I need to hear them. And you need to hear, we need to hear them from one another.